Okay, so today we're going to learn about, um, and you can tell your, your colleagues that aren't here today, there will be some stuff from the, definitely from this lecture on the exam. Um, we're going to learn about the licensing of architects. We're going to learn a bit about agency um, and how that's relevant to the contracts that we've been talking about. And then we'll talk about um, forms of association, business associations, you know, how you guys, uh, what type of businesses there are um, and, and their relevance to your legal standing um, when you sign a contract, your liabilities, and everything else. So um, let's start off right away with the licensing of architects. So the purpose of the licensing um, is we kind of talked about a lot of this stuff already this semester. Uh, why you want to have life, architecture license? Well, there's a public interest. So, you know, we talked about um, the, the, the standard of care is for safety to the public and, and other things. That we, the contracts you want to have industry standards for the safety of the public. So licensing is the same concept here, is you want to have, um, you want to protect the, the public from incompetent design. And, and as a result of that, the states are going to develop a series of standards, um, and ultimately there's licensing exams. You guys will, hope, hope, I don't know if all of you, but the, the name of you guys will study and take your, take your AREs and, and, and so forth. And so that's part of the whole process. And so you want to make sure that we have this public interest. There's actually also kind of a nuance, there's a business interest to licensure of the architects. If you think about it, um, if we didn't have licensed architects with a requirement to be licensed, anybody with a, a, a computer or back in the day with a, a set of pencils and paper could go ahead and design stuff, and then they could build it. And, and, and that's what happened for many, many, many years, you know, hundreds of years ago. It was a, an apprenticeship. You, you worked for a, a master, and they, they taught you, and they kind of kept it in the family or kept it within the, in the line. But what they wanted to do is say, well, we don't want everybody to have the opportunity to be an architect. We want to make sure we control that. And, and so the, the people that were architects and the governing bodies, like the American Institute of Architects, working with people in various local governments and said, let's create this unique category, in addition to the safety aspect of it, of a licensed architect. And then once you get your license, then you can actually charge more. And if you're not a licensed, licensed architect, you can't go in and design that space. I'll show you about that. And so, and that was important. Um, and, and in fact, there actually was recent legislation um, in Illinois trying to expand the licensure requirements and who can be licensed and also relating to um, mechanics liens. And we'll talk a little bit about mechanics liens throughout the semester. It's a right that you guys have as an architect for, to make sure you get paid for the work you have done. But if you think about it, um, some people when they get out of school have design, you know, you can come out where you can be an interior designer, you can be an interior decorator, you can have these skills where you understand design and everything else, but you're not a licensed architect. And do you want, as the architectural, architectural community, do you want competition from the interior designers? In fact, I actually work between my um, junior and senior year in architecture school, I work for an interior architect. Now, they had two licensed architects on staff, and the rest of them were interior architects. They weren't licensed, they were just interiors. And we got, because we had licensed architects on staff, we got lots and lots of commissions, lots and lots of projects, because so much work is done once the core and shell is put up. One of our biggest clients was General Motors. And so General Motors would come in and they would lease a space, a series of floors, of an office complex that was already built. And then we would go ahead and design and do the, the spaces like that. If there was no structural elements, we could do it without having the licensed architect sign it. But what happens is you start to kind of bleed over or blur the lines as to what is architecture that requires a licensure if you're going to be doing um, MEP, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, or civil engineering, those type of stuff, the interior stuff, versus structural, versus just I'm doing space planning. Space planning doesn't require licensure, but if you turn into things that have engineering behind it, you have to have the licensure. And so the architectural community has a business interest that I want to create our own separate category so we can hang that shingle, we can represent that we're licensed architects, and that as a result we can make more money off of that and we can keep the, art, the interior architects from infringing or taking some of our business away. Um, as I said, there was a push recently in Illinois to change the status of an interior architect and their ability to lean the projects and, and, and try to elevate that. Um, 
that actually, as it went through um, the Illinois legislature, uh, it, it basically died on arrival, and then the governor put in this special uh, mandatory veto to try to bring it back in. It's not really clear where that's going to go. Um, and then I was actually just reading recently an article by the American Institute of Architects, and not just in Illinois, but across the country, a number of states trying to actually increase business and, and tax revenue for the states are trying to reduce the licensure requirements of architects in their various states. They figure if there are more people out there that are practicing, practicing with the quotes around it because it's not licensed architecture, but practicing architecture and doing work, then they will generate revenue and then the state can tax that and generate revenue for the state. The problem is, is if you start to erode the licensure requirements, then you get the problems with the people that don't have the skill, they don't have the educational background or the historical time. Because like in, in Illinois, once you get out, you have to have practiced for, it's, it's a, the, the, I think the way the statute's written in Illinois is you have to have eight years of education in architecture before you can take the exam. Now, most people go to school for either four years plus a graduate program or five years or what have you. And that gap of the remaining three or couple, three years of quote-unquote education isn't necessarily formal education in school, it's in the field as you're working as a drafter or working as an associate at an architecture firm. That under the Illinois statute is considered education and after you have your eight years in total, then you can sit for the exam. If we reduce those requirements, the education requirements, the engineering requirements, the exam requirements, to increase the population that can do archi architecture in quotes, um, you reduce and you have you, you sometimes uh, um, put in jeopardy the public interest, um, and then there's this blurring the line for the business. And so the architect, will, the architect name, being an architect, doesn't count as much. So there was a there was and still is a business interest as to whether we license or not. And as I said, there's, there's kind of a, 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 a trend that appears to be going on in the country of reducing some of those requirements. So in Illinois, um, what do we do? Who's the, the, there's a department that covers and, and uh, regulates your work. And it's the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, the IDFPR. It used to be just the IDPR. And they added in financial because basically these are professionals. If you want to think about it, this, this agency, this state-run agency, handles architects, doctors, lawyers, and the reason why it's financial is as, as accountants. If you think about the professionals out there, and they are going to be um, uh, helping to establish what are the parameters for these various professionals to be licensed. It's an administrative agency. And if you remember in your hierarchy, the lecture that we had of the hierarchy of laws of where that falls in, um, and they are regulations. They create regulations. Now, the regulations that they create, they have the force of law, but they don't have to go through the House and the Senate and to the governor. Because what's happened is by creature of statute, the, the House and Senate and the governor, in, in every state they have one of these professional um, agencies, have created an agency and embodied that agency the power to create its own regulations. And that's what it does, is it passes regulations, those have the force of law, they can fine you, they can have penalties, there's lots of things that those regulations have. Um, and it's more specific than the legislature. The legislature says we are creating the IDFPR um, and, and, uh, and that's going to govern your body. That's the general legislation that's created. And then the professional agency comes in and says, your requirements are eight years. You must take the ARES. You must do this. You must pay your fees. You must have so much time of continuing practice. We, we won't let people come in from another state unless they sit for our exam. Lots of other things. So that's what the, they make the specifics in the agency as opposed to the legislature makes the general. So you want to go back and take a look at where this falls in your hierarchy. And if there's a law that would come up and a question that you say, well, where does it fall and what's it rank? Is something, does something have an overriding power? Um, on that concept, this, this um, more specific than legislature, if you're thinking about in the hierarchy, that, that slide that we had that had the seven things, you may have the act of a legislature may be above an agency. And so you would think that the legislature, whatever they say, trumps whatever the agency says. That is true. 
But if the legislature just says, I'm creating this agency, you go police yourself, then there's no conflict between, and then the law of the agency is the law of the land for those purposes. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, so what else do we have? What can, be, what can happen as far as relating to your license of architecture? Well, um, sanctions can be for violations of the licensure statutes. And the licensure statutes is going to be, there, there may be a high-level statute I know in Illinois that's created that says you need to practice the eight years of, of edu practice slash education for eight years, and you must be licensed. Um, and then the IDFPR goes ahead and has a number of other smaller regulations with that. If you violate either or of those, what can happen? Well, there can be fines or penalties leveled against you. So if an architect is in violation, maybe they haven't kept their license up to date. They haven't filed the proper paperwork. They were licensed, but they just didn't pay their fee that year. And you continue to, quote, unquote, practice architecture under that license, you can be fined. Um, if you violate, if there's some moral turpitude of language in there, or if you are, meaning you're, you're not upfront and honest with your clients, if there's issues where the, the payment of services, maybe you're falsifying billing records, all of those things, the IDFPR can come in and they can fine you and give you penalties. It's a monetary thing. Um, they can also deny you the licensure on subsequent applications. In fact, I had a case, um, and this was, uh, this was actually an interior architect. She was not a licensed architect, but the work that she was performing was for interiors. And it turned out um, her company had employed two or three other individuals that were represented as interior architects. Now, the IDFPR didn't legislate over that, but the, the architectural community, the interior architectural community, had their own kind of separate in, uh, uh, series of rules and regulations um, after there was this battle between the architects of Illinois and the interior architects of Illinois to make them on equal level and the architects of Illinois prevailed, what the interior architects did was, okay, if you're not going to let us be a licensed architect, we're going to create our own licensure. Now, it doesn't have the same force because it's not under the IDFDR, it's not under its regulations, but they did that for the same reasons we were talking about in the last slide, the business purposes. If you could say you're a licensed interior architect, it sounds better than a must space planner or an interior decorator. And so they created their own licensure, but it doesn't run through the state. But as a result of that, there was a, there was a woman that we were dealing with, one of her employees was quote unquote licensed by this agency, and she hadn't done what she needed to do, and she had misrepresented some things. And so we actually, in the course, because I was representing someone on the other side, we actually uh, reported her to the agency and said, this individual from this firm uh, is in violation of your own regulations. And she was suspended. So from there. Now, the impact of that uh, to this woman's, uh, this other designer's um, continued livelihood, I don't know because it, that licensure was kind of um, more in name than in, than in substance because it's not truly under the Illinois IDFPR. But it still has some effect. And, and the same thing if it happened on the architect side, same thing would happen to me as a lawyer. Um, there's there's uh, what's called the ARDC, the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Committee that runs on its own agency. And if I violate a, a statute or, or a law that I'm supposed to follow or a code on the practice of architecture, I can lose my license, I can be fined, I can be sanctioned. Sometimes you lose your license for a period of time. So that's one of the things. Um, the inability to sue for fees or fortune her of all fees, that's something else that happens to an architect. If you are practicing architecture and you are not licensed and you don't get paid, you don't necessarily have the ability to recover for the work you've done. So um, this last category is where most of the disputes happen as far as the legal community. Um, Fines and penalties and designs of de denial of licensure or, um, or suspension and those things. That happened where someone may report to the IDFPR and then that just is, it just comes down and it's not, doesn't go through the court system because they have their own governing power. In this part, inability to sue for fees is where you're going to see the most litigation. Um, so the question is, and the clients, here's the question that comes up, should the client be avoid paying for fees simply because of no license? So here's an example, um, and I have this individual, there is a case in Illinois 
Um, and I've actually used it in a couple of lawsuits, and I had one client, unfortunately one of my clients, that was victim to it. Going back, I think this was in the 50s, um, there was an individual, and he, uh, he himself was a licensed Illinois architect. He was retained by a homeowner to design the house. The homeowner entered into a contract with the company that the, the individual worked for. The individual it was a sole practitioner. It was just him. That's it. But for tax and other reasons, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this lecture, he had John's Architect, Inc. It was a sole proprietorship. It was his own company. That's who entered into the contract with the homeowner. John himself was a licensed architect. The company was not. Now, how can a company be a licensed architect? They don't go to school and everything else. Well, the state recognizes that. And the state recognizes that many people that are practicing architects are not only going to be just, I'm going to be representing and working in a contract with you. They create companies and for a whole bunch of reasons. And so if you have a certain percentage of licensed architects working in a company, whether it's a partnership, a sole proprietorship, a corporation, LLC, whatever the structure of that company is, if you have a certain percentage of licensed architects, that company itself becomes licensed. So the individual, the homeowner, entered into a contract with the company. The house was designed. There were problems with the owner in its, uh, whether they liked the designs or not from the architect. There was issues with design issues, lots of things that had to do with whether the architect did its job or not. And so the homeowner didn't pay the architect, skipped him. The architect sued. I did all this work. And maybe I had some issues with some of the work. You may not like some of the work, but I did the work. And maybe we can talk about whether there's a reduced fee and whether I have issues in that. But you owe me money. And the state said no. Because the company was not licensed. The company was practicing architecture without a license. And as a result, they were not entitled to recover for the work that the company had done. And the guy's thinking, but I did all the work. I'm a sole practitioner. It's just me. There's nobody else. I did all the work. And the state still said, no. You worked for your company. You did not enter into a contract with this, this homeowner. The company did. And so what ended up happening was they lost the ability to sue for fees. And all the money was forfeited. Now, this second bullet point, should the client avoid paying for fees simply because that company had no license? And that's where you get into some of these, there's, there's moral questions that come in with as a lawyer, and there's ethical questions, and then there's this thing what we always like to call a slippery slope. If we made an exception for this one individual, because he's a sole practitioner, he is the company and everything else, how do you then go the lines and blur the lines when you have a partnership and you have one practitioner that only does the design and the other one only does the accounting? Is that okay? What happens if you have a corporation where there's only one person doing the design and other people do other work? Is that okay? So the courts have to say, we have to create a bright line here. So yes, the client who had, while well, they used it as a legal tool to avoid payment, was right. Because the company with, with whom they entered into a contract was, was operating illegally. And in fact, I don't, it's not in the case because the case was between the homeowner and the company, but it wouldn't surprise me if this architect or the company actually ended up getting fined by the IDPDR when, in that, at that period of time because they were in fact practicing without a license. So, I will tell you this, like I said, this came up with me in real time I worked on a case, this is about 10 years ago, and I had a client, um, it was very frustrating to me. I had a client who was, uh, it was a Philadelphia, it was a, I don't know, it was Philly or just somewhere in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania architecture firm, fairly well known. Um, and they had their, their main guy, he was like their, their hot architect, he, he had been doing it for years, had been retained by a series, uh, a conglomerate, of, of um, people from Ireland. We always refer to them as the Irish Cowboys. The Irish Cowboys retained them to the, this architecture firm out of Pennsylvania to design a, a, a themed restaurant in New York City. It was, this was kind of at the time when things like um, Frog Cafe, is that what it's called? The, that cafe that, that's down the, by, by the McDonald's down in the loop. 
Rainforest Cafe. It's got a big frog on it, right? Isn't it? Okay. Rainforest Cafe or Planet Hollywood, these themed restaurants. Everybody was kind of, look what, look what Hard Rock, or Hard, or, uh, yeah, it's Hard Rock, look what how great that did. So they were doing it. And so what this guy came up with, the idea of these Irish cowboys, was they were huge science fiction fans. And so they actually created a restaurant downtown New York City called 2112. And it was, if you had walked into the planet Mars in the year 2112. And you could cruise around. It was all this space themed restaurant. And the, ar- the, the, the architect from Philadelphia uh, designed the space, and, um, and they did it uh, in New York City. And they said they wanted to expand because it was doing very well. So they were going to come out here, and they were going to design one here um, that was going to be out uh, one of the northern suburbs malls. They were going to put it in there. And they started designing, but the senior designer, not the big guy, but their senior designer on the project, he left the company. And he went to go work for himself. And he hung his shingle here, and he got himself licensed, and the Irish Cowboys hired him. And he stole all their designs. So I got the phone call from the big guy from the, the Philadelphia firm, really furious because one of his employees took off with all his drawings. And the Irish Cowboys owed this firm that, was repre- that I was representing about $600,000. Plus... This architect had stolen the designs and was continuing to work for the Irish Cowboys, so there's copyright infringement. There was also some other elements of, the, of some, some components in the restaurant that had trademark issues and trade design, and there was potentially some patent issues. So the reason why I was brought in was because I've done a lot of intellectual property work, and I was brought in to focus on the IP work, and we were doing a lot of work and, 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 and kind of grinding through that, and I was about ready to go in and file a temporary restraining order in federal court to shut everything down. Because this guy, this, this former employee, had stolen all these drawings, and both the Irish Cowboys and the former employee were infringing. And it was a pretty good case for us. And as we started getting ready to put the case together, I said, I need to get all your licensing information because I want to make sure everything's buttoned up. Well, it turns out that this gentleman is licensed in Illinois. In fact, he was licensed in like 14 different states or 20 states or something like that, um, and was a big shot. But he had never licensed his company. His company was licensed in a number of states, but it was not licensed in Illinois. So I called him up and I said, how long have you had this, you, you've had this contract for like a year and a half, right? Yeah. I said, you, don't, you can't get any of your money. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, because there's a law that says you need to practice, if you're going to practice architecture in Illinois, you'd be licensed. He's like, I am licensed. I'm like, but your company's not. So you're owed $600,000. You can't collect a dime. And I sent him this case. He was livid. He called me up. My father was a judge in California. You're wrong, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, fine. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to call for you to decide and call the Irish Cowboys. I'm going to try to settle this case as fast as possible for you because they had already been paid about $400,000. They had been paid a chunk of money. I said, because if you read the paragraph in the case, not only does it say you can't collect the $600,000 you're owed, but the $400,000 they paid you, you have to give it back. I said, my recommendation is you let me, give me the authority to get as much of that 600K as I can. We'll worry about the copyright infringement elsewhere, because you still have those rights, but you're not going to recover any money, or you're going to have to be writing a check back to them. He fired me. Didn't believe me. Ended up having later on, I found out later from the, uh, how I got the case was another attorney in Philadelphia. They tried to go after him. Tried to go after the Irish Cowboys. Not only did not get six hundred thousand, but the lawsuit was to give the four hundred thousand back. There was a counterclaim, and they ended up settling. And this guy from Philadelphia paid a couple hundred grand to the Irish Cowboys to give money back. So the statute's pretty real; it's pretty strong. You can't do it without a license. So wherever you're working, if you're if you're going to hang your own shingle or everything else, make sure the company, whoever's entering into the agreements, is licensed. So it was kind of a big deal. I just remember being on the phone, and he's telling me that his dad was a judge, and I'm like. Okay, that's fine. Why don't you send this to your dad? His dad passed away, and he's like, it couldn't happen. I'm like, you know, I, I, go, I, I, I can't change the law. It's a pretty simple case. It was only like five pages. It's pretty simple. I'm like, read it. Make sure you read the last paragraph where it says you may have to turn the money back. And that's what you want to do. He was not happy with me. But, you know, that's the way it goes. He registers the company. So you have to have at least, I believe in Illinois, you have to have at least one-third of the active practice, practicing architects licensed. And that company 
then becomes can become a licensed practicing art But you have to register it. So it's just a simple form. It's literally a form. The problem was that he's like, oh, register, I'll register. I'm like, okay, go ahead and register your company. And he did. I said, but that isn't retroactive. It's from when you registered going forward. So you guys had already done a million dollars worth of work. You've been paid 400000 You're owed 600000 All of that was by an unlicensed architectural firm. So... But like, let's say you're a firm and you have 10 architects and you only have two licensed architects, that company cannot be licensed. You have to have three or four, whatever. I think it's, I think the, the statute says one third, but I'm, I can check on that. But it's not, I just got one person. Um, it, it could be one to one, like this one was, or if it's a partnership of two people, you only need one of those two, maybe even three. So it, it, there is a number, that, a percentage mix you have to look at before the company. And then once the company has those individuals that are licensed, then it simply is, you, you turn in the paperwork that says, here's all our license numbers, we want to register this company, and then you keep that active. And then the next year, let's say, let's say you have a nine-person company and three are licensed. That company stays licensed. The next year, one of those licensed people leaves, then your company is at risk of losing its licensure because they don't have the number of requisite people. So, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. A separate license? So the question, the, 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 the key part of your question is, that I ask back to you, has you, have you as an individual, for tax or liability purposes, created a company? So if you created a company, then both entities. But if you are just hanging your shingle out as Mike Hanahan architect and I'm going to do architectural services for you and I haven't created a company, then I don't need to get two. But if I create Mike Hanahan LLC, then I have to have my license and the LLC has to be registered. And it's simply a form as opposed to it's not like, it's a fallacy, you can't, you can't send the company to school. But it's just a form that this, this corporate entity or however, this partnership or whatever it is that you've created for tax or liability issues is registered as well in the state. And that's the entity that's entering into the contracts. So, we'll look there in a little bit and kind of our slides to explain a little more. Okay, so now that there's, there's different, there are two different types of licensing, how the states look at licensing, okay? There's what's called a holding out statute, and there's what's called a practice statute. Illinois actually uses a hybrid of both. Okay, in a holding out statute, it simply requires a design professional to sue a per, to, to, I should say, not sue a particular label, to issue a particular label. Sorry for the typo there. So it just says I have a label, okay? That, uh, that's what I am. I'm an architect. Holding out states where they have a holding out, they don't regulate your work. They don't go in and look at it. You just are holding yourself out as an architect, okay? Now, this allows the, the public to know that the license architect is competent but nothing for the unlicensed. So if you say, I'm, a, I'm an architect, if you say, I'm a licensed architect, if you're holding yourself out as a licensed architect, the general public knows that they are, have gone through the exam. But if I say, I am an architect, the general public doesn't necessarily know. So I was actually reading something the other day where there was a, a, an architectural firm and... Um, had hired a, a young draftsman, uh, and that's what they, they, had, they hadn't had the schooling, hadn't been licensed. The, 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 the principal of the firm was a licensed architect, hired this draftsman, and he printed up a series of business cards that said associate architect and gave that to the draftsman for purposes of making this individual look to be a little bit more special, maybe to be able to have a, a higher billing rate, you know, because if you're if you're going to be retaining this company, you say, okay, I got I got principal, I got associate architect, draftsman. Well, draftsman should be a lot less than an associate architect. So this individual had asked the question, what do I do with this? Because I'm not a dra I'm not an architect and everything else. If it's in a holding out state, because it doesn't say associate architect license or it doesn't have any license number or anything else in it, the public's not going to know, and that's okay. It's okay by that state. It's not really. It's not. I don't think it's good, but it's okay by that state. If you are licensed, you would hold yourself out as a licensed architect. In a practice statute, you cannot practice architecture without the license. And what that does 
is the practice of architecture itself is defined. It says, the practice of architecture is the act of A, B, C, D, and E. And in a practice state, if you are doing A, B, C, D, and E, you must be licensed. It has nothing to do with whether you have something on your business card or not, or your sign, or what you tell people. If you are practicing architecture within this defined parameters of what that state statute says, you must be licensed. Now, one of the questions is here is what's the definition of architectural services? Is Because the contracts you're going to read are going to say we will provide the following architectural services. Is that the same as the legal practice of architecture? And in fact, in both the practice statute and the holding out statute, an individual who is not licensed, and this is where it gets a little gray, an individual can provide architectural services if they're not licensed, so long as it doesn't fall under the umbrella of what overall the practice of architecture is. So there may be, and you think about a draft person, draftsman, someone that's going to be, or designer, there's lots of people, when you go to work for an architecture firm, some of you guys have worked for them or not, as I have already, some will work when you get out, there are lots of people that aren't licensed. In fact, there are some brilliant designers. Some of the best designers are not licensed. They maybe don't want to, they maybe haven't been able to pass the exam, it may not be good test takers, whatever it is, but they are a brilliant, creative designer. And they are creating the space plans and all this other stuff that is an architectural service. But are they practicing architecture by being designed? Arguably not, because the whole practice of architecture includes the creation of drawings for construction documents, lots of other stuff. And so you kind of have to, you have to balance that. Um, but here, the last thing here is you simply cannot contract with an unlicensed architect. This is what I was talking about here in Illinois. You can't, if you're in a practice state, you can't contract, enter into a contract with an unlicensed architect, but you can, if the company or the individual's license, you can enter that contract. So if I'm just a designer, and I'm doing freelance. And in fact, I did freelance to help pay for law school. So when I was in law school, my summers, I did a lot of interior design work. I could never do any architecture because that was needed to be licensed. So I could actually get retained. I got paid for one of my friends owned a sausage company. I designed two of his um, interior uh, restaurants. Not restaurants, but like little delis that they came in. They had That was part of their business. And I, I did a, a friend's... Um, a build out of the basement of a friend's house, um, some other stuff. There was no structural, no electrical, it was just space planning. Um, that was okay, but if I was doing something, because that's an architectural service, not the full practice of architecture, which includes other elements of it. So that was okay, but if I wanted to do architecture, the practice of architecture, I would not be allowed to in Illinois because I wasn't licensed. As I said, Illinois is a hybrid. Illinois requires you to be licensed to practice. It also says you must hold yourself out if you are or you are not. So the individual that was the draft person that asked the question, can I have a business card that says I'm associate architect? That draft person is definitely providing architectural services but is not licensed. So in Illinois, that holding out of the business card, I'm representing myself holding out to the public, would be in violation of the Illinois law because it says associate architect and the concept of architect is a practice of architecture. So they can, so it, if the balance, and that's one of the things that happens is and when I was talking about why they require a certain percentage of, of, of licensed architects um, to be, to make sure that the company's licensed, is because if you go back to the public interest, those that are licensed have to oversee the services of those that are not licensed. They have to make sure that the drafts person's designs are actually proper and they're drafting it correctly because the licensed architect is the one that's going to stamp the drawings. And so the, the state requires that. And so Illinois is both a practice statute and a holding out statute. Um, any questions on that? Does that make sense between the two? Okay. Um, who should be able to decide about 
contracting parties, well, that's, again, the state that decide, decides who can contract. And this, again, goes back to this point about whether you are an individual and your sole proprietorship, who should be entering into the contract. If you have elected, you, the individual, to create a business entity to protect yourself, and you enter into contracts with that business entity, the state says that business entity, because the state can make that requirement, must be licensed as well. Um, so another thing about this, and this goes back to now we're looking at the concept of what practice of architecture, when you have this firm that's got three or four or five licensed architects, and then you have the draft persons and the associates that are working under it, is that okay? Is it okay, like this draft person, whether their business card says something or not, is it okay? And what is this, what is the, when you go to send the drawing to be sealed? And what does the state look at to make sure that it's proper? So. One of the things that's important is that they look at what's either a, a, a balancing test or an observation when the state says, has there been a violation of the act? Has someone been practicing architecture in violation of act? They look at content participation versus the flyby review. So the firm that I was telling you that I worked for, that we had two licensed interior architect or two licensed architects on staff, they didn't do all the designs. I I worked. I mean. One thing that I was really good at was designing bathrooms. I don't know how many bathrooms I designed that summer. It was not that I actually was really good at it. It was a really easy thing, and they gave it to me. But I, I, I did drawings with electrical and lighting and everything else, I, I, and, but that wouldn't have been legal, except for the licensed architect would come in, and he would review, and he, he became involved in telling me what to do. And so that fall, fell under the content participation. Now, what many firms do, or what many interior architectural firms, is what I learned that summer, um, that do not have a licensed architect on staff, what they would do, or even an architectural firm that, let's say, they don't have um, an electrical engineer on staff, or a mechanical engineer on staff. Sometimes what firms did for many, many years, they don't do it as much anymore, for many, many years is they would design the whole space, everything, soup to nuts all the MEP, the architectural, the structural, and everything else. And then they had three or four companies, and they'd say, I'm sending to the electrical engineer, the licensed electrical engineer, a separate, a separate company, you know, your friend down the street, I'm sending you my drawings. Will you take a look at those and stamp them and approve the electrical engineering drawings I did? And then you send this, another set to the, to the mechanical guy, and you send another person to the structural guy, and so those drawings come back, and they're submitted to, this, to the, the city to get building permits. So you got an electrical engineer stamp, you got a mechanical engineer stamp, you got a structural engineer stamp. They've all been approved. And each one of these separate companies would get a fee. Here, here's a couple thousand bucks, do this for it. It wasn't an under the table thing, this was the practice of the business. Well, what ended up happening was is there was too many lawsuits because there was no coordination. Somebody would just come in and they would literally look at it and be like, okay, this looks fine, stamp, stamp, stamp. They wouldn't do the coordination between the electrical work and the mechanical work, and they weren't working together. So the states have now, and this isn't recent, this is in the last probably 20 years, have cracked down. And you are, you must have, they talk about the, the participation, the active involvement by the licensed entity, whether it's the licensed architect or the licensed mechanical engineer or otherwise, for those designs. So what is, what's, what's come from that, and how a building is the design now, is instead of the architect doing everything, the architect does the architectural designs, and they send the architectural designs to the mechanical engineer, and he does all the mechanical engineering design and actively participates. And then it comes back to the architect, and then he sends those to the electrical engineer, and the electrical engineer does its work, and sends those back to the architect. And the architect is charged with what's called coordination, to make sure that they're not overlapping, and that the home runs of where the electrical conduit is, is not going to be interfering with the mechanical HVAC systems are going to go. So the architect has a, assumes a coordination role, but is not doing the design. So past, the architect did all of that and would send it out and people would stamp it. Now, they send out the components, the various systems, to those licensed people to make sure that it's not this fly-by review. And, and if you get into this situation, if you're ever working for a small shop and they say, oh, we can do this and we're just going to send it out to our person down the street, they do this for us all the time, 
you got to be warned that that's actually not proper. That's not legal. I, certainly not in Illinois. I know not in Michigan where I practice. I did not practice where I did my interior work. Um, I imagine most states. I haven't gone through and looked at the list, but I, I would imagine that most all states are have eliminated the ability to do this kind of fly-by review. Um, last thing here, reciprocity for out-of-state architects. What do you do uh, when you have, like, my guy who was from Philadelphia and wants to design something in the state of Illinois? Does he have to sit for the exam? What can they do? Well, states have a certain reciprocity. So the good thing is, is there's the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards. They create the ARES that you guys will ultimately take. So it is a national standard that you take when you take your exam. And that's nice. And so the states can say, we recognize at least this national standard. And then there may be specific rules and regulations from state to state. You're not going to be taking anything on your Illinois exam, licensing exam that has anything to do with earthquakes. But you certainly are going to do it in California. And so there's going to be certain nuances from state to state as to what is required in order to be licensed in that state. And then to get the reciprocity, what's going to happen is a state like Illinois... They're going to say, well, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Iowa, the Midwestern states, we kind of all are designing the same way. If you've passed your boards, you got your license in Michigan, and it depends on what state you're in, and you have practiced, with the definition of practice, architecture in Michigan for X number of years, we will allow you to come in and have reciprocity and simply file and pay a fee. I don't know what the number of years are for Illinois for those reciprocities for the various states, but if you haven't had that number of years, two or five, sometimes it's like five out of seven years or two, three out of five years, whatever it is, if you don't have the requisite number of years of practice of architecture in that other state and you want to come practice in Illinois, you may be required to take the exam again. But so they allow this most states allow reciprocity, but if you get into areas where there are more um, specific or stringent requirements, such as earthquake requirements for California, they will not. Uh, the other area, this thing here, hot versus cold states, um, a hot state, Florida, Arizona, places where people want to retire, they almost never allow reciprocity because there's too many people that are in their late 50s, early 60s who had a nice career they want to retire, they want to go and have where they have their place in Phoenix, and if all those people could just hang a shingle because I've practiced architecture for 30 years in Illinois, and I'm a really good architect, and you don't have to worry about earthquakes in Scottsdale, um, or Phoenix, or wherever you are, then you have a flood of the market. And so we go back to that very first slide for licensure. Licensure is public interest. Well, I'm a really good architect. Look what I did in Illinois for 30 years. I'm not violating public interest, but the state of Arizona has said, business-wise, if too many people are coming in as a business-wise, our licensure statute says, you've got to sit for our exam. If you want to sit for our exam and you prove us that you're to pass, we'll give you a license. But we're not going to give you reciprocity. So, the hot versus cold states. Obviously, cold states, you want to come practice here? If you can show you've practiced enough, like Illinois, three out of five, or whatever it is from another state, we'll let you in. So there's a flexibility there because, you know, there's not a lot of people that are retiring to northern Michigan or Minnesota, you know, to, to practice architecture. They're going to go someplace nice. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, questions regarding the license direction. If an architect can pass a company exam, such as the ARES, why should the degree or experience matter? Why does it matter if you can take the exam? Going back... Many, many years ago, as I said, it used to be this apprenticeship. And, and so that's what the educational, that's what, that's what you guys are doing here, what you potentially did in undergrad. That's supplementing or taking place of what the old apprenticeship world was. And the reason why they have to have it, just because I can take an exam and pass a competency exam, doesn't mean that I've given enough. And so they want to create, and, and, and the, the the question of the, the number of years you agree, plus what I had called quote unquote education, working for someone, those are relevant. And the state wants to say, we're going to go out and, and make sure there are accredited architectural programs. One of the things, I mean, this isn't an accredited program. In fact, I don't know if it was three years ago, 
the um, UIC was was under accreditation review, and so all the professors had to come in and, and submit to the accreditation board the programs of their of their um, classes and what they taught you guys and how they did that. In fact, even I had to. I had to come in. I got. I was. I was kind of nervous. I had to come in and I got interviewed by the National Accreditation Board for universities for their architecture school of architecture because in order for my class is considered a business legal class, but it, it's required for your graduate degree. And so part of your accreditation, this is a required course, you have to take this. I had to pass on behalf, and if my class wasn't sufficient in its curriculum, and I had to have, I, I submitted all my slides, and I obviously referred them, I said, if you're going to listen to my lectures or online, and all this other stuff, and then I had interviews, that's important. So the states say, it's not just the exam, we want to make sure we have an accredited university and we're in the process, again, for protecting safety. Okay. Um, does having a license pre prevent incompetence? Absolutely not. You know, just because you are licensed doesn't mean that you're going to actually then practice the way you should. People are sloppy, people are lazy, things happen in their life. You never know what happens. So just because you have a license doesn't mean you're going to be competent. Hopefully you are. That's the reason why. But, you know, but there are plenty of lawyers that I deal with. Whether they are so incompetent they should be disbarred is another question. But there's plenty of times where I get off the phone with a lawyer and I'm like, oh my gosh, how could that individual actually have gotten a law degree because they really don't know what they're talking about? So license doesn't have anything to do with competence. Um, what about licensed interior landscape architects, contractors for design? So we've talked a little bit about interior architects. Same thing, landscape architects and, and contractors. They're not licensed. A landscape architect is not a licensed entity. They have to have licensed architects on staff. When I represented Navy Pier on the redevelopment of Navy Pier, it was for James Corner Field Operations, which is a huge architectural interior design. James Corner is a landscape architect, and he is amazing at what he does, but he has a team of licensed architects on his team on his, that work on these projects. Um, but he was a landscape architect. He's just a brilliant designer and a great businessman, and he's been able to sell his designs in um, Battery Park and, and a lot of other things that were just spectacular. And I think he did a great job on Navy Pier, or his team, actually. Um, uh, contractors for design. Here's an interesting kind of nuance in the developer world. This is where I actually see the most problems in residential world. If I, as an individual, buy a plot of land, and I'm a, whether I'm a contractor or not, I can design my own house. It's kind of weird, because ultimately I'm probably going to sell it, but I don't need to be a licensed architect to design my own house. I don't know why, but you don't. So all these places you see going up, these little one, these three flats and everything that are going up in the city where it's by developer, they may not have a licensed architect on staff. The, because what ends up happening is when they finish it and they close on it, they, the the entity that has built it, the developing entity, keep it. Whether it's just for one day, they complete the design and then they can sell it to somebody new. If they're designing it on spec, if, if, the, if, if you come to me and say, Mike, I want your construction company to build me a house, I would have to have a licensed architect because you are asking me to do it. If I go out and start designing it and you see it being built and you come to me and say, when it's done, I want to buy that and here's some ideas, but I'm doing that work, that's okay. But if you asked me and hired me to design it and build it, I couldn't do it. It's a very weird nuance. Um, so there's this, this, whether you want to call it a, a gap in the law or a, uh, a provision that allows developers to develop more business and not have to hire architects, who knows, but they don't have to necessarily be licensed. It's only for residential areas. You can't have the developer go out and put up an office building because they're not going to keep it themselves. Um, and it normally only happens either your single family or those little three flats you see. It's a very small area where this is certainly in Chicago where this kind of legal room that comes in. Uh, but that's one exception. And then, all right, finally, um, why prohibit the recovery of fees for practicing without a license, especially for license if you're licensed elsewhere? This was this example of, of um, my Mars guy um, and the Irish Cowboys. And the point is, is, is we can't make an exception. This architect from Philadelphia was licensed in, like I said, like 15, 20 states. And his company was licensed in a number of states. So it wasn't like they were doing bad stuff. It's not that they weren't incompetent. Actually, they had done one in New York, and it was, it was at the time, wildly successful. Um, but the point is, is, is you cannot 
you cannot make an exception. We have to define rules. And the rules are you have to be licensed. And if you're going to practice architecture, the concept of practicing architecture is required. Okay? All right. Let's talk about forms of agency. So any other questions on how to license, license architect is licensed and what's governing you guys? Okay. Forms of agency. So when we talk a little bit about agency, I've men mentioned it a few times. It's important in what you guys do and who's representing whom. If you think about it, the owner hires you as the architect to design the space. So we've got the owner. Think of a triangle. I'll, I'll do this all year. On top of the triangle is the owner. On one point on the bottom, on the left-hand side or your right, is the architect. On the other part of the triangle is the contractor. Owner's going to have a contract with the architect. So imagine that triangle with a solid line. That solid line represents the contractual legal obligations. The other side of the triangle, owner's going to have a different contract with the contractor. Again, a solid line. So you have a triangle on top with two solid lines connecting the owner to the two entities. On the bottom, it's a dash line. Contractor and architect are not in contract with each other. So they owe each other no obligations. Contractor owes owner obligations. Architect owes owner obligations. But we all know the architect, after they design the space, goes out and walks the site and makes sure that the contractor is building it in accordance with the designs. We all know that when the contractor gets paid, he gives the owner a payment application and says, I've done this much work. The owner's like, this is all Greek to me. I don't understand this. And he hands it to the architect. And the architect's like, yeah, they did foundation. No, they haven't done this carpentry. This payment is good or bad or whatever. So the architect is acting and doing certain things to protect the owner. And the question is, is, is the architect and what it's doing acting as the owner's agent? So that's why this is relevant in what we're going to talk about here. Agency is... What, are you, what is your role as an architect on a project site? And are you representing or the agent of the owner? So let's talk about what it is. An agent is a person acting on behalf of another. Okay? The principal is the party for whom the agent is acting. Principal, in this case, the example I've given, is the owner. And potentially, if the architect is speaking for the owner, basically the owner's voice, the architect would be the part for those purposes, would be the owner's agent. The third party, because you have to have a third party in this, you have the principal, you have the agent, and the third party, is the person with whom the agent is interacting on behalf of the principal. In this situation, it may be the contractor. But let's give a couple examples here. An employer employee, the employer is the principal, the employee is an agent. I'm out there, let's say I'm, say I'm uh, Tim Cook. Tim Cook is technically an employee of Apple. He makes millions of dollars and everything else. He's a CEO or I don't know exactly if he's president, I'm not sure exactly his title, but he works for Apple. So what he says, he is an agent of Apple. And everything he says binds the company. So if Tim Cook makes a representation as the agent of the company and that representation turns out to be false, it's Apple that's liable, not necessarily Tim Cook. It can come all the way down to a small company, you know, a two-person company. One person may make a representation, may say, you know, I had to do this or I had to do that. If they have misrepresented, the company can be sued because the agent is speaking on behalf of the company. Actor, agent, an athlete. So you have an agent that works for an actor or um, an athlete. My sister is in the movie industry. She um, develops scripts and, and uh, puts out movies. I'm trying to think of something you guys might have seen that she's done. There's a series of, of um, for lack of a better word, teen horror films called Final Destination. Anybody seen any of those Final Destination movies? She did all of them. So she found the talent. She worked with a company that was the producer. Okay? Well, when they hire the actors, she, her company, is the third party. She calls up the agency and says, get me an actor to play this role. The agent is representing the actor, saying this actor is going to work for you. And so my sister is the third party. There's the agent and the actor. 
Same thing with sports. Happens all the time. So it's a simple concept. That individual that's speaking on behalf of you represents you and is your voice and your mouthpiece. Real estate broker, same concept. Owner architect, but this is to a limited extent, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, and we'll certainly talk about it in the next two day, next two class sessions, because your contract in this case will define your agency relationship. Do you guys all understand where that fits? Okay. The purpose of the theory: Why do we do have an agent? Well, often the agents may have a greater expertise than the principals. If I'm, an arch, if I'm an owner and I need to hire an architect for some stuff, there's lots of things I don't know anything about. Or even if I'm a sports agent. My, my, my athlete may be sophisticated or not, but they may not know really where the market is. And the agent's res- job is to make sure they have that knowledge. Certainly what's going to go into contracts. Um, there was a movie that was out a, a number of years ago, and, and it, it's a while so you may not have seen it, but it was Jerry Maguire. Anybody know the movie Jerry Maguire? And there's a scene where Cooper Gooding Jr. is like, show me the money! And that became this big buzzword and everybody used to say and stuff, and, and I think he ended up winning an Oscar for it. That's your kind of, your, your, your concept of, of that Tom Cruise was the one that had all the specialized knowledge, and, and the athlete in this case was like, just get me the cash. And I'm not saying that happens with all athletes or anything else, or, or actors, but um, from what my sister has told me in dealing with some of the agents, some of the actors are like that as well. You know, just people are just like, just get me my money and whatever I need to do. So there, that's why you have it. Um, what is another reason why? Principals need to delegate tasks. Well, they can't do everything. The individual that's hiring the agent can't do everything. On, on a project, lots of projects that I work on, on big projects, I'll recommend to the owner to hire what's called an owner's representative. So you've got the owner and the architect and the contractor, and then there's just other entity over there, the owner's rep, that's going to be kind of the watchdog for both the contractor and the architect. Because the owner doesn't have time, so you delegate those duties. And then certain legal entities can only operate through agents. So if you want to sell real estate, you can sell by sale by owner for residential, but if you have a commercial property, you must use a real estate agent. So the law mandates you have an agent. So that's another reason why. Effective agency agency. The agent may bind the principal to a contract. May. This is an interesting point. We'll talk about this, and this is something you want to think about because there probably will be a question on the exam about whether someone's bound to or not. So in most instances, the statements of the agent, in fact, do bind the owner or the principal. But there are some certain situations where it's not, and we'll talk about them coming up. Um, what's the other effect? Knowledge of the agent is attributed to the principal, even if the principal does not have such knowledge. If I'm in a negotiation as an agent with the third party, and I learn stuff from the third party, and then I, and we come to a final deal, and we, we, we strike the contract, and we have all the terms and conditions, and I deliver that contract to my principal, to my actor, And there's a whole bunch of terms and conditions in there. And the actor reads the whole contract and understands it, but doesn't know all of the information that's going back and forth between the studio and me as the agent. It is deemed that the actor, in this instance, knows everything that we talked about. All of my knowledge as the agent is, whether it's real or not, has been imputed to the principal once that is a part of that. So that's important. So... That's why you have to have a good relationship with your agent to make sure you're getting good communication. Also, the acts and omissions of the agent are attributable to the principal. I'm acting as an agent for a company. I'm an employee. I'm on my way to a project site. I get into a car accident. I'm negligent as a driver. I, as the company's agent, can be sued individually and the company can be sued because the negligent acts of the agent of the company can be imputed to the company as well. So that's a legal definition that's important here as well. The agent, and that's why you need to have this good relationship with the agent, the agent binds, the agent knows, and the agent acts all on behalf of the principal. So, that's why we have a series of duties If you are the agent, you must 
follow these duties, and if you violate these duties, it may not exonerate the company, but the company could have an action back against you to recoup the losses. You have to have a duty of loyalty. She can't be doing double deals. I can't be sitting down with a studio and saying, hey, let's get this actor in if you get me some money under the table. That's not a duty of loyalty. Let's change this contract. We'll let this thing slide if we can do something else. So you owe a duty of loyalty to the principal. Care. You can't be negligent. This kind of comes through in everything we do here. As an agent, you are responsible and obligated to make sure you cover under, look under every rock. You make sure that you've done your job, your due diligence, before you go ahead and bind the owner to that contract. You have to act care. Obedience. If your principal says, do not sign this, do not agree to this, whatever the directive is, the agent must follow those directives. They are not allowed to deviate. And then notification. If I learn something in those discussions, because it's imputed onto the owner, I have a duty to tell the principal, here's what I learned in these conversations. So the agent has these obligations. And what happens if they deviate? So let's go back to this issue of where the car accident happened. Okay? I'm supposed to be driving this company car on the way to the project site. I, should be, I, have to, I have to go to the project site. I need to drive with care. I've been told by my boss to go there. And I need to tell them if there's anything that's going to happen on the way. I make that deviation from the example I gave before, and I go to Target to buy my own stuff. Now, there's a question of whether that deviation was little or big and whether it removes that. But let's say that the injured party is able to prevail at court against both the individual and the company. And the individual that's injured, the third party that's injured, elects to recover that million dollar recovery from me, the company, the principal. I have to pay it because the court has deemed my agent was acting on my behalf and everything my agent did is imputed upon me, including liability. So the third party gets a million dollar check from me. If while you were doing your deviance and going over to Target or whatever you're doing, you breached one of these four bullets. Loyalty, care, obedience, and notification. If you breached one of those, I could have a counterclaim against you as the agent to recover some or all of the million dollars. I would make the argument, the court or the jury may have deemed you my agent, but I am now saying you have violated your agency obligations so you owe me to recoup. So there's a little bit of protection for the principal to make sure you keep the agent in line, so to speak. And there's also a risk. If the agent goes out of line, they themselves become personally liable. So if in that negotiation with the movie studio and there's something going on underhanded, the actor, if something goes south, could potentially recover from their agent. Does that make sense? Um, source of the agent's authority. This is where, remember I said, may bind the principle. This is the where this comes in. So there's three types of authority where the agent has authorization to act on behalf of the owner. There's actual authority. It's expressly granted. It's either written or oral or implied by their discussions between the owner and the agent. You are going to go to Paramount Pictures and negotiate the contract for me for the new Star Wars movie. I give you authority to do that. It's, a, it's actual authority. You are my agent. And in fact, I mean, if you think about it, in, in, in most of these instances, if we're talking certainly um, sports or theater or, or movies or whatever, you sign a contract with an agent. Real estate. You're going to sign a real estate agent. It's a brokerage agreement. Um, employer, employee, depending on how high up the food chain you are. You know, if you're just somebody that's working for a dollar wage, you know, uh, an hourly wage, you probably aren't going to sign an employment agreement. But if you're going to be an officer or a director or somebody that's senior that, that will be speaking on behalf of the company, they probably have an employee agreement. For my firm, I have to sign a partnership agreement. I have to sign an agreement that I, because everything I say as a partner of Chip Harden, I am binding my company to my comments. Every piece of advice I give to a client Every single thing I say to them on the phone, 
binds my law firm to that. So I have actual authority from my company or as a partner to be the agent of the company. A parent authority. Parent authority is the next one. A parent authority is the authority the principal lends to third parties, leads, I'm sorry, leads third parties to believe they are granted to be an agent. And the principal is the one that creates the apparent authority, not the agent. So what does that mean? Well, let's say we're going to a series of meetings and there's the third party and the principal and they bring me along. And during the course of these discussions, every time that third party has a question, the principal looks to me and says, well, Mike, what's your thought on that? What do you think you should do about that? How do we handle that? And we have this discussion and it's clear and there's, a, there's knowledge that there is a reliance by the principal on my advice. After two or three meetings, the principal can't come and I'm the only one there. That's an apparent authority. You have, the owner has led the third party to believe that I'm authority. Or maybe it's not even a meeting. Maybe it's on a phone call. Hey, I'm going to send Mike and Ann over. We're going to talk about contracts. They are deemed to have apparent authority to act on their behalf. But it's the principal that gives that. The agent can't come in and say, ah, hand in hand, I'm Mike hand in hand, and I got hired by this guy, and I'm going to talk about it. The agent can't create that imperative, implied authority. Or the apparent authority, I'm sorry, the apparent authority. It only is the principal that delivers that. So if you're in a situation where you have the third party and the agent, and no one has ever from the principal side informed the third party that the agent is acting on your behalf, the third party should not and cannot legally rely on what that agent is saying or that apparent agent is saying. Does that make sense? Last way. Apparent or ratification by the principal. Sometimes you may be in a situation where it's whether it's not clear whether it's apparent authority or not. No one's been really told that this person speaking is actually speaking on the principal's behalf. But after the agreement has taken place, the principal says, yeah, I accept it, I adopt it, goes along with the terms of the deal. That acceptance and adoption is ratification. It's a retroactive blessing of the actions of the agents. And so that creates a retroactive agency relationship after the fact. And it could be, even if the, th this is an interesting thing, I may tell an agent, don't ever agree to X. Do not go in and agree to X in that deal. You can do whatever you want, but do not agree to X. Agent goes in and says, we'll agree to X. And then comes back and tells me, and I'm furious. I'm like, I told you not to agree with X. I told you not. And you say to me, yeah, but it's the only way to get the deal done. If we didn't do this, they would have walked. I'm like, but I told you not to deal with X. But they would have walked. And then I go ahead with the deal. I never authorized that agent to act that way but then I've gone ahead with the deal knowing that they're going to walk if I don't. By that action, even though I specifically and expressly said don't agree to X, by then adopting it and agreeing to it going forward, I have ratified that agent's actions. And anything related to that is binding on me. Um, like I said, the, the ratification be expressed or implied. And then this part, no, not all actions by the agent are binding on the principal. So there could be, I could say, don't do X and don't do Y. Those are two specific things they're not authorized to do. If my actions later on flow with X but not Y, I've only ratified the X, not the Y. So I don't have to... Ratification of one element isn't ratification of all. Okay? And where, where this comes into with respect to architecture is there's going to be times where you're on the project side as an architect and you are going to say things to the contractor. Don't do this here. Stop work there. I don't agree with this payment application there. If the contractor relies on every one of those elements as the architect acting on behalf of the agent, that may not be proper. That may not be accurate. Because the contract, if we go back to that triangle, that solid line contract between architect and owner will define for what purposes the architect is actually an agent versus not. It will have what's been authorized and not authorized. And that's definitely in the B101. I think this is the last slide on, oh no, there's one more after this. Um, undisclosed principle. An agent that pretends to be acting on behalf of her own behalf, but really acting on behalf of an undisclosed principle. That can actually happen. You can have someone that's coming in, happens a lot of times in real estate. 
that you are retained by someone behind the scenes and they're acting as your agent. I had a, a buddy of mine from college and he worked for this guy um, out of the Far East. He's from Hong Kong. And they bought and sold um, real estate all over the world. Uh, in fact, at one time they were looking at buying... Um, um, what's the name of it? The Venetian in Las Vegas. I remember him calling me up. He's like, I'm in Vegas. We're maybe going to buy the Venetian. I'm like, what? And, uh, but he was never allowed to disclose uh, the guy he worked for. Like, I, I, I still don't know the gentleman's name. He's worked for him for like 20 years. And so my friend Dave would go in and negotiate deals. And he would be the, 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 the front person as part of the company that was buying it. But in reality, they were buying it for this individual in Hong Kong. So that can happen. There's an undisclosed principle. Um, and then the agent may indicate there's a principal but fails to refuse to provide identity to the principal. That can happen as well. Some of the deals that my, my buddy worked on, he would say that he was representing an individual but wouldn't tell him who they are. Um, the third party may have a claim against both the agent and the principal, depending on if that's been represented. Um, and the third party really has the right to know with whom it's dealing, but depending on how much they want to do the deal, there's business versus law. So sometimes you have a situation where the, the entity on the other side, the third party on the other side, um, they, they have the right to know, but it may or may not be relevant for the, the terms of the deal. So it's kind of, those are more business than legal issues. I'm sorry, what, say that again? Normally what would happen is, is if there was a lawsuit, because the, as it says here, you have a, a claim against both the agent and the principal, at some point in time, the principal would become um, disclosed. So, uh, there, there's, a, there's an interesting, it, it'll be interesting to see when it finally comes out. I, you may or may not have seen in the courts, there's this, um, there's a, a entity that's part of, my granted, the criminal side, that's part of, the, I think, the Mueller investigation, there's this, we don't know if it's a foreign entity or not, and they've had all these secret hearings and everything else. Well, they're being represented by, I believe, a law firm from Atlanta, I think is where they're out of, and those are an agent on behalf of that entity. And so the government is looking into that and whether they have to comply with the subpoena and everything else. The lawyers are that entity's agent. That principle exists, so it's in this that they're, but refuses to, refuses to provide. Now maybe the judge knows, and there's a whole host of reasons of why that entity hasn't been disclosed. The question is, will that ultimately be released? And I know that's a criminal versus a, a, a commercial or transactional issue. But normally, if you get to a lawsuit stage, normally at some point in time, the, 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 the principle is disclosed. So. Okay, last slide on agency. Um, termination of the agency relationship. So sometimes, you know, it's over. Okay? You, you know, you're not going to always be the real estate agent. I'm not going to always be uh, Jerry Maguire or Cuba Goody Jr. or whatever his character's name was. You, you're not always going to have that. So, um, your agreements between principal and agent will have, uh, it may have something in writing. The agency lasts, your relationship will last until the termination of the project or what have you. And there can be, but typically you're going to have an express or implied termination. So, it may expressly say, at the end of this term, the agency relationship is over. Or, you may get fired. That's an express termination. Or, it may be implied. So, sometimes what happens is in a real estate agency, the real estate broker's contract, the license that you enter into with your real estate agent, it won't say when the agency's terminated. It may be that until the sale of the house, and then by nature, once the sale of the house is over, the agency's terminated. I actually had uh, this instance come up with me um, my wife and I had a condo um, that, that I had bought before she and I were married, and I had actually bought it with a real estate broker who I loved. Um, she was wonderful. She did a great job for me. But in the ensuing years, because I, I lived there for a number of years, and then I bought my townhome with my wife, and we kept that in as a rental property. So it was about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years had passed from when I bought the, the condo to when we decided we wanted to sell it and we moved to the Burbs. So I called up my old friend. I called up the agent. I, mean, I wouldn't say friends, but we, we had, had a good relationship. She had gotten really kind of big time. So she didn't do like condo stuff anymore. She did big stuff. But because we had a nice relationship, she's like, sure. So she had sent me a little broker's contract. We signed it up and everything else. And, and, and I don't necessarily blame her for this, but she really did absolutely nothing to work my property. 
And I was like, it was just sitting there, sitting there. And I'm like, I don't, we're not getting any showings. We're not doing anything else. This is killing me. Like, I have to sell it. My wife was pregnant. Like, lots of stuff was going on. And so I pulled out the contract. And I'm like, I got I to gotta fire her. I felt really bad that I had to fire this person I had such a good relationship with. But I had to. And I went through the contract. There was no termination language. It was basically open-ended until the sale was done. So there was, it was an implied termination when the sales was done, and I had to expressly write her letter and say, you're fired. So you, you sometimes you have both. Okay. Um, at the end of any given period of time, or when the purpose has been accomplished, that's like I said, it's on the sale of the property, or you sign the contract, or, or whatever it might be, the finish of a construction project. That's the termination of the agency relationship. Um, the principal can terminate at any time. Um, it may be a breach of the relationship, from a contract or specific period, I actually wrote, because I'm a lawyer and I'm kind of anal on this, I, I wrote it very, the letter to her very nicely, but I basically said, you have, in nice terms, you have breached your contract because you never showed the unit. And you had an obligation to sell this and actually work it. She was out making big deals. She was, she was making a lot more money off of the paltry little 5% she would have gotten on my tiny little town home, or condo. So, um, but I had, to, I had to make sure and say that she breached the contract to keep it legal. Uh, and the principal should advise third parties of the termination. So this is an important concept. Let's say that you're in a business relationship and one of your, your corporate members, the vice president, is the one that negotiates deals for you or some deals for you. And somewhere along the lines, the vice president's in this deal, one of your big deals, and kind of moving it along. And then you, as the president of the company, find out that the vice president has violated, has, is embezzling from you. So you fire him. And you let him know. And this guy, you know, you have two weeks. Give you a two weeks notice, or whatever the issue is. Give him two days. And that individual goes, that vice president goes to a meeting that was set up that afternoon to negotiate the deal for you. And he negotiates that deal, and it's pretty unfavorable because he's really angry with you because you just fired him. But he signs it because they have been dealing with that vice president all along as an agent of the company. As soon as you fired him, the agency relationship is severed. And technically, that individual can no longer speak on your behalf. But the problem is, is the third party doesn't know that. And then you get into this, well, we didn't know, and he signed on the dotted line, and we thought it was valid, and so we think you're bound to it, and you're going to have to perform this really crappy deal. Because it's really good for us. So, if you're in a situation where you've terminated an agent, any individuals, third parties out there that may be interacting with that agent, you need to let them know. I did have this with one of my cases, a company where they had to fire one of the stockholders, because... A whole host of reasons, and we had to contact all the all the vendors in which he was dealing with. Um, and then two days later, we have a videotape. It was actually the brother of one of the other founders. We have a videotape of him taking a huge brick and throwing it through the plate glass window. So that was not a really good relationship. But, but it was we had to contact all the vendors, and that's how we found out. Because he started getting calls from his vendors, and, and so he was mad because we hadn't been able to talk to him, and and then he threw bricks through the window. So uh, that was nice. At least the brother didn't call the cops on him. Question? That's a great question, and that's sometimes where it comes into play, because you're going to say, well, I know you thought he had authority, but I never told you that, and I never did anything, and I don't believe the fact that he sat next to me, the fact that Hanahan was sitting next to me in these meetings isn't enough, because I'm the decision maker and I told you that. Let's say you're the third party, and I come in and say, no matter what, I'm making the decisions, and I keep asking questions to Hanahan, Hanahan, and then I don't show up for a couple meetings, and I keep, Hanahan keeps representing some things, if that deal gets struck somehow and then there's a dispute later on, I, as the, the, the individual that says I'm the decision maker, could say they didn't have, a, they didn't have authority. And that gets into it, and then that's a question really that goes to the jury. 
or the trier of fact that says, was the third party acting reasonable in their belief that Hanahan had the authority? Was the, were the actions, even though the principal said, I make all the decisions, were the actions by the agent and the parties enough that it was reasonable to believe the third party could rely on Hanahan as the agent? And the jury will make that decision. So that, 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 is, that is where almost all of the case law on apparent authority goes, is to what did you believe, what was the actions of the parties to make you think that that agent was speaking on your behalf. And then the second kind of subtext to that is, could they, could they speak and act on your behalf for A, B, and C, but not X, Y, and Z? And how much was that communicated between the parties? So those are the two kind of big areas in agency law you're going to look on that. Okay, last thing. Forms of association. First one, sole proprietorships. You decide to get out of architecture school, you work as an apprentice for somebody for a couple of years, you take your exam, you get your AREs, you build up some really nice relationships, and you're going to hang your own shingle. You're know, like, I don't want to deal with a partner, and I don't want to deal with all this corporate tax and all sort of crap. I'm just going to be a sole proprietorship. Well, any individual who conducts business is a sole proprietorship. So my wife does freelance work. She's a writer. She's a sole proprietorship. She's got a name. I can't remember the name of her company, but she's got a name of her company. My sister out in California has a jewelry business. She's had it for like 15 years. It's called Rock Goddess Jewelry. And she and my other sister who lives here, um, they're like Chicago and L.A. And, and my sister has designed stuff for some of the stars. It's kind of cool. Like they'll go. To, she hasn't got anything to like any big award ceremony, but some of the dinners she gets like Heather Graham and some of the people. Mr. Big from us. Was it... Um, what was that show with uh, Sarah Jessica Parker? Uh, Sex in the City? Yeah, the, Mr. Big has bought some stuff from her and, and everything else. So, uh, at any event, she is a sole proprietorship. She's never incorporated herself or anything else, so anybody can do that. Um, there is, with a sole proprietorship, there is no distinction between the business and the individual. So, if we get back to that case that I was talking about of the architect and the architectural firm, it was, an, it was an incorporated company. That was, it was Architect Inc. They had it incorporated. So if it was just Mike Architecture and I was the license and it was a sole proprietorship and I didn't create some formal legal entity about it, it would have been okay. But they had, in that situation, had created a legal entity. One of the other ones coming up. I think it was Street Incorporation. Um, so there is no distinction between the business and the individual. And as a result... All of the income the company makes is treated as straight personal income. So every dollar my wife makes as a freelance writer is just like she was working for someone else, although you know she pays her own taxes because she's um, self-employed. As a partner, actually, in my law firm, I don't get a W-2 because I'm a partner. I share in the profits. So, um, and we'll partners in the next slide, but... Uh, every dollar that I make is treated as personal income. So there's no separate the way the taxation goes as far as the states are considered in a sole proprietorship. Um, the negative is there's no liability protections. So if you're Hanahan Architects without an Inc. or LLC, it's just a sole proprietorship, and I commit design malpractice, and I get a judgment against me for a million dollars, they can go after my house and my car and anything else that they want, my bank account, whatever it is, because there has been no legal wall distinction between me and my company as a sole proprietorship. So you get the benefits of only one tax, but the burdens of liability. Okay? Um, sole proprietorship, you can assume a name. In fact, that's what I did, actually. When I was, um, as I said, I paid for my way through not all of it, but I paid for some of my legal fees, uh, legal law school fees, not legal fees, thank God, uh, my law school fee, uh, uh, tuition um, when I was in law school, and I had a, my name of my company, my design firm was MWorks Architect, because I worked architecture. Um, and uh, I probably was, at the time, obviously, since it was, I said, used the word architect in my title, was probably a violation of, of the act at that time, but I was only doing interior work. Um, and so that was my DBA, doing business as. It wasn't me, it was doing business as, but it was a sole proprietorship. 
Um, and then the, the, the sole proprietorship can have employees simply because um, all of your money and you're not incorporated doesn't mean you can't hire someone from your revenues. It's just is, is a, it's just a structure of how tax and liabilities are. So, um, and, they, and then what? But then, then what's inter interesting is let's say, let's say it's MWorks Architects, and I have a couple of draftsmen working for me, and they do some work, and then they get in that car accident. Um, they can come after me and my car and my house because they're acting as my agents. So that's a risk that you carry. Uh, my wife and I were actually just discussing last week about she needs to become an LLC because I don't want her to be, not that she does anything that could put her at risk, she's a writer, um, but you know, you, you, you want to protect yourself for that. Sole proprietorships, a lot of people do because it's simple, you don't have to file any forms or anything else, um, but it's not the best setup. Next, partnerships. So you go from one to two as far as who owns the company. Partnerships is the same as a sole proprietorship but with one or more, two or more people. So you have a bunch of people and they're all partners, but it's the same concept. Um, you have as far as income is the same down here, individuals are responsible for that. Oh, we'll get there in a second. But your, your money coming in as a partnership is treated as personal income and your liability, they can go after each one of the partners. You can go after their cars, their houses, their, their assets, whatever it is, because there's no structure legally uh, walling the individual partners off from liability elsewhere. There is, however, some law that um, comes into whether you are legally considered under the state of Illinois a partner and what happens from it. So, and those are because a lot of times the partners have issues with each other. You know, when, when one partner does something wrong and the other partner has not, and the injured party goes after the second partner, well then there's going to be the fight between the two partners as to why I should be carrying their, their bad stuff. And so the, the state has developed a series of laws. So there's, uh, if you want to have a partnership agreement. If not, you, go, you default what's called the Uniform Partnership Act. Each state will have one of those, and it kind of lays out the parameters by which the people need to operate. Um, and then um, there's lots of law that's been created by the courts as to how partners and how the, the assets and liabilities are handled and divided and everything else. So there, there are laws that are going to govern a partnership. Um, and then the, the next part is the question about debt and taxes. So an individual partner is responsible for the debt of the entire partnership. Liabilities, you know, if you go out and spend too much money and the company goes down, well, I'm not the one that's spending, you know, so you have to worry about who, everybody shares in that equally. Uh, that same company that I had where the one brother threw the brick through the window, I had another guy, there was four investors originally, it's down to two. The second one, um, it, was, it was kind of an interesting group. There was the, the techie creative guy, and he was the one that threw the brick through the window. There was the sales guy, because they were going to be selling this product and advertising services. And then there was the, um, kind of the, I don't know what you call him, he's like the, the kind of the, the glue between all of them, and then there was the, 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 the money guy, the big business guy that knew all the contacts to set up the deal. And, and uh, the creative techie guy was the one that got let go and threw the bricks through the window. The sales guy that was selling their product um, unbeknownst to them, uh, took like 18,000 bucks from the company and um, went over and had a vacation with he and his wife over in the Far East. She was from out there, over there. I don't know what country she was in. And they didn't know about it and they found out there was a bunch of money that he was spending that taking from the company and incurring debts on behalf of the company and the partners had to absorb his loss. So he was let go as well um, for the, per the partnership agreement and, and then, but the company had to Recoup, had to carry his losses that he owed money to from that. So that's one of the problems. And then the um, partners and profits and losses are taxed pro rata to the partner's interests. So uh, depending on um, who owns what percentage. So if you own 50% of the company, you may get 50% of the profit. So that's the way profits and losses are, are looked at. They, they look at your ownership interests um, when you do that. Next. Uh, 
Ownership and division between the partners. Rights and duties may be divided by any agreed percentage. So I have the, uh, maybe in voting, if you want to vote on something, it may not be equal. If there's five people in a company, it may not be everybody gets a, a equal voting share. In fact, lots of times it's not. It may be by longevity, it may be by uh, economic contribution, that the weight of your vote is more or less than someone else. Um, one partner may have 75% of the profits, but only 33% of the losses. Maybe there's three people in the company, and they have set up the partnership agreement that says, I put in most of the money and the blood, sweat, and tears to get this company up and running, therefore I should get 75% of the profits. But if we go down, we're all going down together. So that's how you can have a different division between profits and losses. All this is saying is, and then not guarantee the salary, all this is saying is the partnership agreement, the agreement between the partners, one, two, three, five, however many people that are partners, is just a contract. And we have decided that the terms of this contract, including how much profit and loss we share between each other, is an agreement where we had a meeting of the minds, and we all said that was what it was going to be. So there's no formula. There's no three people, everything split three ways, and everything carries the bird three ways. It can be whatever the parties agree to by that contract. Okay. Um, back to agency. Each partner is the agent of the other and the other partners. A partner has the full authority to act, act or bind the partnership. What I say as a lawyer, binds Schiff Harden. That's period the end, because I'm acting as their agent. I'm a partner for Schiff Harden. All knowledge is fully attributable to partnership, just like we talked about the agency. If you're acting as an agent, the knowledge is attributable to you. And then the partnership duties, because it's like an agent, it's similar as agency duties, um, but they operate in a two-way direction. So sometimes in an agency relationship, it goes one way only. The agent imputes it to the principal. But if there's not an imputing, if there's not language that goes that way, it may not go back the other way. For the partnership, it goes both ways. One partner speaks and acts no matter what is imputed on the other one. It, it, it will go back and forth regardless. Agency can be a one-way street. Last slide on partnerships. Um, what's the effect of a partnership? Income is treated as personal income, just like a sole proprietorship. And just like a sole proprietorship, no protection for liability. You can go after your house, your car, your assets, whatever, and any of the partners. So, good for tax purposes, because it's only personal income, bad for liability. Limited partnerships, we've heard of, of LLP, limited partnerships, or just simple, um, actually limited, LLP is a legal, limited legal partnership. A limited partnership is, is a little bit different, um, where a limited partnership is just a financing mechanism, you're going to come into some things like that. Like I have a deal right now where there's a limited partner and a general partner, and it's, it's about financing and and this is there's a trust involved in some other things. Um, the role of the general partner is the same as a regular partnership. What's kind of interesting is, is if you have a deal with a limited partnership, you have the limited partner and the general partner. The general partner is the person out in public talking on behalf of the company. Almost always the limited partner has very it's behind the scenes, but they are the money. You would think in a, gen in a limited partnership, the limited partner has kind of nothing, but the limited partner actually has all the power and all the money, and the general partner is the one out talking. So that's where it says, the general partner is like a regular partnership, the limited partner is, they don't manage or bind a partnership, they're not an agent, because they're all be kind of behind the scenes, um, but they're, and they're only, they're only liable to the extent of a financial contribution. They're back behind with the money. They are limited in their liability. So that's where the investor is. The investor says, yes, we want to build this hotel, in Dallas. I have the money, I want to recoup the financial from that, but I don't want to carry all the risks. So we're going to create this limited partnership entity. My general partner is going to go out there and run the deal, and they're going to run all the risks and everything else. I'm just the financial backer. So I'm not binding anybody, I'm not doing anything else. It's a, like I said, it's, it's just primarily a financing mechanism. Um, I'm only raising that because you may enter into deals from time to time or deal with limited partners. Uh, in, in your, your work later on. It's not going to be any questions on the exam saying, you know, tell me the difference between a limited and a regular partnership. So I just wanted to raise that as, as a, it's a legal entity that's out there.
corporations. So corporations um, are, again, legal entities. They're created by statute, but they are treated as people. A corporation is like the, the courts look at it as people, like an entity, an individual. Again, like the partnership, they're governed by state law. There's the Illinois Business Corporation Act. Um, the corporation will have articles of incorporation and bylaws, the rules of how the company acts and operates. Um, and you're going to have shareholder agreements if it's a closed corporation, so there's going to be a, another set of rules if you have a closed corporation. The difference between, real simply, between a closed corporation and non-closed corporation is like a non-closed corporation is something that's publicly traded. But you can have a closed corporation where the only people that own it are the, the, the stockholders, the people that own that company internally. We're not, we're not on, the, on, the, on, the, on the market. We're not on NASDAQ or on the Dow or anything else like that. So closed is, you're incorporated for whatever reasons, but it's closed. Rights of the owners, because the owners of the company are shareholders. What are their rights to the corporations? Well, they have the right to vote for directors. If you are a shareholder, you have the ability to vote. If anybody owns any shares, occasionally you may get something of a publicly traded company. Occasionally you may get a, a, a notice in the mail that says the following people are up for the board of directors. And you, you can vote if you want, or, and your vote is valued how many shares you may own. Um, so you have the ability to vote for that. Uh, you may get dividends. Some some companies issue dividends. Some do not. Uh, and then, if there's a corporate dissolution, if the company is being sold, your stocks of shares have a value. They should, hopefully. Uh, and then you get the value of those shares on, on dissolution. That's the rights. What else about corporations? Um, the corporate hierarchy. So from top to bottom, you have the shareholders. They are the owners of the company, but interestingly enough, they are not agents of the company. And just because you own stock doesn't mean you can speak on behalf of the company. In fact, you cannot bind the company as a stockholder. You're an owner, but you're not an agent. Directors, directors of the company are agents, and they have a fiduciary duty. So not only as an agent do they have those four care, loyalty, obedience, and notification, but they have a fiduciary responsibility, which means they also must act for the best financial interests of the company. So the directors are agents and a fiduciary release obligation. Officers, again, agents in their own fiduciary relationship to the company, so they have to act on best of the both of the company's corporate and financial um, benefit. And then finally, you have employees of the company. And many employees are going to be also, but by, by the way, directors, officers, and employees almost always will have will be shareholders as well. Um, the employees, so you could be an employee and an owner of the company. Anybody that works for, you know, Apple or General Motors or whomever, they probably own shares and they are an employee. They are limited agents. So it depends on your state of your employment. So like your average software developer at Apple is not going to be an agent. They're just an employee. Um, Johnny Ive, or what, I think that's his name, um, some of these other guys that work that are officers or their employees or maybe some of the senior levels in their stuff, they may be agents as well. So you don't have to be an officer or director to be an agent to bind your company. You know, it just depends on where you fall in the food chain. Last slide on corporations. And this is the, this is where we come to a difference. Why why do we hang our shingle as a partnership or sole proprietorship versus a corporation? What's the reason? As I said, come times into tax and liability. Okay? Um, so there is no personal liability for corporate malfeasance. So the company, remember I said a corporation is treated as an individual. So the officer or director or employee who is an agent of that company unless they have deviated in their acts as an agent, cannot be held personally liable. So when Tim Cook makes a representation on behalf of Apple, Apple can be sued, but Tim Cook cannot be sued personally. There is a personal wall on the way corporations have been set up. Okay? Shareholders, officers, directors, employees are not liable for the corporate acts. There's also a complex restrictive tax and accounting purposes. There's double taxation. So because 
because the corporation is treated as a person. When Apple makes a million dollars, the federal government taxes Apple at that corporate level. And then any money that comes down from that paid to Tim Cook also gets taxed. So it's been taxed twice. Let's take it at a different level. Let's take it from Apple down to just an individual. I'm an architect. I incorporate my company. It's just me. If I was a sole proprietorship and I got $50,000 as my commission to design that house, I would be taxed once on that $50,000 because it is personal income. Because it's a sole proprietorship. If I set up a corporation, so it's Mike M-Works Architecture, Inc., when that $50,000 came in for that job, M-Works Architect, Inc., that $50,000 gets taxed once. And whatever's left over comes to me as personal income, it gets taxed again. The double tax with corporations. So that's why if you're a sole proprietor, if you're an individual, I would not recommend you to become a straight corporation. There's other things coming up. You could be a, an LLC, and we'll talk about it in a slide or two. But um, it's a double tax. So that's the negative. The positive, no liability. The negative, you're paying double tax. Then there's a question also on the legal thing is, is could there be a piercing of the corporate veil? Can you say that the individuals that are acting, how do I get to that individual? If the corporation, let's say the corporation has no money. Let's say at the end of the year, the corporation has paid all this money out to their officers and shareholders, and there's zero dollars in that corporation. But there's been actions by the officers that are clearly malfeasance. How do I get to them? Well, it, it says in the first part, they're protected. You can't get to them, but... If you can show, if you're the injured party, you can show that there was that corporation is a scam, is a, it's just a shell, it's not there. If there's some action, somehow then you potentially can pierce the corporate veil. It's a difficult part in the law, but you can do that. Sometimes, in very specific instances, you can do an end run and get to the individuals, but that's rare. Um, professional corporations used to be in vogue for many, many years. Uh, and, and it would be, certainly falls into the individuals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, architects, the professionals. Um, they would create a professional corporation. So there are some firms that are out there you'll still see, you know, like Hanahan, Jones, and Smith, PC. If you see that word PC means, that's professional corporations. Some architecture firms still carry the PC, and there are some protections from that. Um, it, it works a little differently than a corporate, the straight corporation rule, because it's, it's basically like a partnership that's acting under the corporate protections, but they still have the double tax and still some of the other problems. So, um, like I said, you see a few in Illinois, but 20, 30 years ago it was, it was a big deal, a lot of people did it. It has now been replaced um, by LLC, Limited Liability Companies. So, a limited liability company is kind of like a corporation, but it's a little different. What happens is, the lawmakers in Delaware kind of came up with this first. Now every state has it, but the first state that came in with LLCs was in Delaware. And they said, how do we protect the individuals and yet not have them have to be taxed twice? And what they do, they say, well, let's create a law. And they'll tell them that's what happens. Let's create a law and we'll call it a limited liability corporation. And so what it does is it creates a separate legal entity, just like a corporation. So we're not a partnership. We're not a sole proprietorship. We're not hanging ourselves out there for exposure. We're not a corporation, but we're going to be kind of like that for purposes of tax and counting. For tax and counting, we're going to be treated like a partnership. A bunch of, instead of partners, they're called members or managers. We're going to be treated like we get our money and we only get taxed once. But we like this whole liability protection. So money comes into the LLC, that $50,000 comes into the LLC, I am a member. It only gets taxed when it's given to me. If the LLC holds on to it, it's never taxed. When it comes to me, I get taxed as personal income. But if I did something wrong, 
they can only sue the LLC. They can't come after my car, my house, my personal assets. So the LLC is kind of the best of both worlds. And that's why you see that all the time. And almost, almost every deal nowadays is done is under the, an LLC law. So, um, again, it's governed by Illinois, by state law. Every one, every state and union has a limited liability uh, company act. Illinois has one. Um, it's not as much court created. It was created by the statutes, and then the courts have now adopted it. Um, and instead of bylaws, you create something called an operating agreement. So there's a partnership agreement with your partners, and there's bylaws and articles of incorporation for the corporation, and in the middle is this operating agreement. Pull some language from your corporation bylaws and, and articles of incorporation, pull some language from the partnership agreement, kind of mix it all together, and you get this thing called an operating agreement. It's the rules by which the members and managers play. And one last slide, I believe. Oh, no, there's one more thing after this, real quick. Um, hierarchy. Members are like the owners. They're like shareholders. If you're a member, you're an owner, shareholder. Managers are like officers and directors. So it's just, it's the horse of a different color. It's just a different name. Um, and you can have employees just like a corporation or a partnership or um, sole proprietorship. Um, LLCs are the best vehicles for complex organizations. Often seen a single purpose entity. So um, here's what happens a lot in construction. Uh, and you guys will see this all the time. I am a co- I'm a contracting firm, a construction firm, and I'm gonna I've been hired by or I've been I've been I'm, I'm gonna get a job to build an office complex. Um, I will create a single purpose LLC, so it's like um, John's Contracting uh, L- probably John's Contracting LLC is the big company. And then we're being hired to develop something on Polk Street. So you may call it Polk Street LLC. And it's just a subset of John's company. And that is a single purpose. It is only there strictly for that project. Nothing else. Once that project's done, that company dissolves. And they do that for purposes of even like liabilities and dollars and there's nothing in there. So... Um, they do this all the time, single purpose LLCs. Almost, I don't know how many construction projects. Like, I'm doing a deal right now with a hotel, and uh, the owner has created an LLC, and that LLC will go away as soon as the project is completed and the hotel's up and running. It's simply created solely for that project. One of my partners um, represents a big uh, condo and apartment developer, and every single project they have created. Uh, they built, it's probably 30 buildings in the city and around the area, uh, is a single purpose LLC. And once that bit project is done, that single purpose LLC goes away. So, um, it's also good for unique partnerships. So let's say you have an architect and a contractor that want to come together and do a design build project. They will create their own single purpose LLC for that project only. Uh, we're dealing with that right now. I have a big project out in the East Coast. Um, it's a $750 million project, and we have three main bidders, and there are a series of three separate LLCs of conglomerates that have come together because it's a big design to build project. Any questions on that? All right, this, is, this I promised the last slide. So this just shows real quickly a slide of where your risks are and your best in the both worlds. So you can see sole proprietorship, it's really good for flexible taxation and accounting. Very good. No double tax or anything else but nothing for liability, or liability over here. Corporation, not really good for tax and accounting. Lots of double taxing, lots of, pro, lots of work and everything else, but good protection. The LLC covers both. The LLC, you have protection for both tax and for liability. Question? Yes. So, bankruptcy is kind of a different animal. So the question is, 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 is there better, I think what you're saying, is it better for one versus the other if you're in bankruptcy or whatever? So the answer probably to that is no. But well, here's what happens in bankruptcy, and I've had to deal with bankruptcy in a couple of times with some of my, my projects. Um, the, the concept that happens with, I mean, yes and no. But, so the concept that happens in bankruptcy is, is that at some point in time, if a company is financially failing, they declare bankruptcy in this Chapter 11 and Chapter 7. We won't get into whether it's a reorg or it's a full bankruptcy or what have you. But 
But the court, the bankruptcy court comes in, and there's this period of time, like just recently uh, Sears was filing for bankruptcy, and there's this period of time, this preferential period, that if debts or liabilities or income received in this window before somebody at 90 days in Illinois, from if I declare bankruptcy on December 1st, you go 90 days backwards, and every debt that was incurred by um, Sears and every revenue income that Sears got during that preferential period, that's kind of like frozen. Now, the debt goes much further back, and everybody's got their hand out saying, Sears owes me money, Sears owes me money, Sears owes me money. I'm using this as an example because I have a client that Sears owes him money. Um, and so the bankruptcy court comes in, takes all the revenue that the company has sitting in its bank or whatever it's got, plus whatever sits in that preferential period, and kind of gathers that all together, make, puts notice out to all the creditors, and, and I'm way oversimplifying this, but essentially determines who of these various creditors, the people that are owed money, get paid first, and how much they get paid. And it's up to the bankruptcy court to determine who gets paid what, based on priorities and a whole bunch of stuff of, of these individuals that are owed money from Sears. The question, your question is, is what happens to Sears as a legal entity, as a corporation, and is there protection? Well, for this issue, certainly in the bankruptcy proceeding, because there is a, a wall or a dividing line between the corporation and the officers, directors, and shareholders, the people that have their hand out, like my client that is owed money from Sears, cannot collect from any Sears shareholders, any Sears officers, any Sears, Sears directors. So those individuals that are part of that corporation are protected and so you may have the former CEO of Sears worth $10 million because he was taking big checks, or I keep saying Sears, it could be any company. If they have received those funds as a regular distribution and it's outside of that preferential period and a whole bunch of other stuff, those assets cannot be seized. There is the wall, that corporate wall. Now there's that whole piercing of the corporate veil I talked about, and that's sometimes what happens. The company says, I don't have any money, I'm bankrupt, and then you try to get to the individual's money by piercing the corporate veil. It's difficult. So on this chart, the straight corporation and the limited liability company, in that bankruptcy proceeding, the individuals are protected. And the parties with their handout that says, you owe me money, cannot collect from the officers, directors, and employees of a corporation or an LLC. Not so in a sole proprietorship or a partnership. If the sole proprietorship has, that entity has declared bankruptcy, and there's somebody with their handout, arguably they can go after the partner's individual assets. And the bankruptcy court will, will, will suss through that. Now again, that's a very big oversimplification. Bankruptcy is an extremely complex area of law. So yes, to your question is, which is it better if you're in the problem of bankruptcy? It's probably better to be an LLC or a corporation. But, but frankly, this, this very simple chart of the two check marks, your best corporate structure on a basic level is going to be an LLC. So when you get real big, when companies get big, there are, there are so many more reasons to be a corporation. You can have shareholders and go to the public realm. You can use that to raise revenue. There's lots and lots of reasons why people, why the concept of corporation still exists. But the LLC, is, is a great tool for, um, for, the, for the average business person. And that's actually what my wife, when I said we were, we were talking about it last week, she's like, like hey, you've got to be an LLC. We're going to make you an LLC so we can protect your income. Okay. Anything else? Thanks much. We'll see you guys next week. And um, we're doing the B101. Oh, by the way, did, did everybody get, uh, I think all of the stuff is uploaded, all the, the audio. Did anybody check to see that? Okay, good. Um, and I'm going to give this to um, 